So good morning. Welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. My name is Matt Courtney. I'm the recorder and a member of the board of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humans community if you've not already done so. Membership forms are available on our website at humanists.org. If you are listening for the first time, welcome, and we invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all our events listed on the website, humanists.org. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the humanist community. You can find out how to donate to our organization, again, on humanists.org. Our forum today, uh, Jim Van uh, Buskirk, we'll discuss peaceful death another option and i'm going to go ahead and let him if i can find there he is uh i'll go ahead and let him uh give us more information and in, uh, introduce himself thanks matt and thanks all of you for showing up and a special shout out to my pal dick hewitson who got me into this um, so a little bit of background about me. I'm a former public librarian, retired from San Francisco Public Library, and uh, oh, I guess about five or six years ago, got involved with the Death Cafe. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's a uh, um, co-created groups that come together and discuss the stigmatized topic of death. So in any way, shape, or form, people talk about their own health, their parents' health, clutter, pets, communication with the other side, absolutely anything and everything, advanced care directives. And um, as an outgrowth of that, one day, one of the regular members called me and said, uh, Jim, I'm losing my faculties, I'm losing my sight. Uh, I'm a Jungian therapist and a writer and I, I don't want to keep going if I can't be writing a book. And uh, I've called the Final Exit Network, and I'm wondering if you would be with me when the exit guides come. And I said, Margaret, I'm so honored, but I didn't, I didn't know what that entailed. I had heard of Final Exit Network, but couldn't really remember what they, who they were, what they did. Anyway, I spoke to the guides. I showed up at Margaret's and um, within a few hours, uh, she had taken her last breath with uh, a big smile on her face. And I was so impressed with the expertise, the patience, the professionalism of these exit guides that I immediately joined the organization, wrote an article about my experience, and the next thing I knew, I was invited to become a regional coordinator for the organization. So my territory is Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. So if anybody from those states contacts the organization, either by phone or email, I get a message and I call them back. And um, so I've been doing that since fall of 2018. And, and I'm learning a lot and uh, finding it very, very rewarding. Um, so that's a little bit about how I got into this. Um, but I wanted to uh, disambiguate, because it took me a while to figure it out, uh, between the difference uh, between the uh, state legislations, the medical aid in dying or uh, physician assisted dying or death with dignity um, that is available in a handful of states. Here in California, um, it's called the End of Life Option Act and it was approved in 2015 and in effect, uh, went into effect in 2016. And as you might know, it, uh, they're all based on the first 
Death with Dignity Act um, that uh, was implemented in Oregon in the mid 1990s. So I'm gonna talk about that and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how Final Exit Network is, uh, is different. Um, let me just find my, well, actually, let me, let me interrupt myself and even back up. So one of the things, one of the resources that I um, send to my, uh, the people I speak with and they find um, very helpful is a, a recent document that Final Exit Network has put together. And it's called Six Options for Hastening Death in the Face of Intractable Suffering or Loss of Selfhood Through Dementia. And uh, I'll just read through them quickly. Uh, the first is to stop therapeutic medical treatment. So that's a passive approach. Um, uh, then another passive approach is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And I can talk about uh, more about these uh, if you're interested later. Then there's medical aid and dying, which I mentioned uh, we're fortunate here in California that we, we have such legislation, although there are uh, challenges to that. There's also medical aid in dying in Switzerland, and many of the people I talk to consider uh, flying to Switzerland. But for most people, I think this is a pretty expensive option um, because it can cost between ten and twenty thousand dollars. Not to mention the ability to get oneself um, to Europe. Uh, and then there's two resources that we recommend. Uh, Final Exit 2020, which is a um, revised version of Derek Humphrey's classic book, uh, Final Exit. And another uh, resource that's very useful is called the Peaceful Pill Handbook. And that one's available both in paper and online versions. Um, and people get all excited when they hear about the Peaceful Pill Handbook. Uh, until I tell them that it's a bit of a misnomer uh, because there is no such thing as a peaceful pill. But it uh, contains a lot of information on various uh, methods of self-deliverance and it rates each one for reliability, availability, peacefulness, um, and is, uh, is very useful because what I tell my the people I talk to is it's good to have looked at all the options as one is making what might be the most difficult decision one ever has to make. And then the sixth of the six options is the Final Exit Network's Exit Guide Program. And I uh, will certainly talk more about that. But let me just go through, in case you're not familiar, because I wasn't, with the, uh, the death with dignity requirements in California. Um, so you may know that you have to be at least 18 years old, a California resident, mentally capable of making and communicating healthcare decisions, and diagnosed with a terminal disease that will result in death within six months. Um, and that's, uh, and then there are more stipulations, uh, you have to have, um, two physicians sign off, there has to be a waiting period. There's uh, each, each state has a bit of a variation on the specific protocols and procedures, but it's the um, terminal diagnosis and six month uh, prognosis that leaves a lot of people out of not eligible. And Final Exit Network has a little bit different, um, oh, so, excuse me. So, and the medical aid in dying is a cocktail. One has to be able to self-administer, one has to be able to swallow, the GI tract has to be working, and it's a series of four medications, and even uh, that, uh, those cocktails change depending on the state and uh, keep being uh, tweaked. So that, that's one avenue, one possible option. Final Exit Network is sort of what I call a parallel universe. So we have different criteria and we support a different modality. 
the modality that we support is inert gas. And originally we um, advised people to use helium. And a few years ago, 100% uh, helium was, became unavailable. And the tanks of helium were party helium and they were being cut with oxygen and did not uh, do the job completely. So now we have switched and are recommending nitrogen. Uh, same protocol, the, um, the person gets a tank of nitrogen, uh, gets a regulator, an adapter, uh, builds a hood. When the time comes, the hood is pulled over the head. The person continues to breathe normally. It's just that they're breathing increased amounts of nitrogen. The, uh, the person loses consciousness in about 30 seconds and the canister empties and the body lets go after about 10 or 15 minutes. So we consider this peaceful, painless, and foolproof. Um, and this can be done by anyone on their own with the support of friends or family. But what Final Exit Network uh, provides is the experience and the expertise of its guides. So these are people who have been trained who have experience working with people and can troubleshoot uh, to make sure that uh, if and when this protocol is desired, that the person, that it's successful. Because the one thing I tell everybody I talk to, uh, whatever they decide, be 100% certain they're going to be 100% successful. And I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of people saying, well, I've, I've got a stash of drugs. Uh, I'm gonna take that with a tumbler of, of vodka. It's like, well, that might work and it might not. People have awakened, awakened from that or thrown up the pills or all kinds of unexpected mishaps and they risk being uh, incapacitated, incarcerated, institutionalized all the things that they may have been trying to avoid. So um, that's why uh, some people are DIY and know exactly what to do and how to do it. And other people really want the support of an expert with them. Um, so uh, Final Exit Network uses a different, um, set of criteria, and let me just pull that up. Um, let's see. So our cri exit criteria is, um, we support uh, degenerative diseases like ALS, Parkinson's, um, uh, people in, with chronic severe somatic pain, um, we uh, also, under certain circumstances, are able to support people uh, with dementia. And we also have a, a, catalog, a category that we call constellation of conditions. I remember one of the very first people I spoke with, a 92-year-old woman who uh, was going blind. And I was new and didn't know. I said, well, Audrey, I'm not sure just losing your sight is gonna be enough to qualify you. And I said, do you have any other uh, issues or challenges to your quality of life? And she shot right back, no, I wish I did. Well, as we talked some more, it turned out that um, there were some things that she was losing the ability to do. And so she fell into the category that we call constellation of conditions, any one of which might not qualify a person for our support, but, uh, but added together, uh, make them eligible. So the way that uh, our protocol and procedure works, and it's very well thought out, and it's to safeguard the organization, its volunteers, and also the, the callers, the, the considering this as an option. So when I talk to people, I tell them that we recommend people apply for 
support services when they think they're about a year from exiting. And of course, no one really knows. Um, but some people call and say, well, I'm fine now, but I'm thinking three to five years out. And we've learned that much too much can shift in that period of time. Other people call and say, okay, I, I can't take it another day. Can you come Thursday afternoon? Well, no, we can't work that quickly. So uh, we, we recommend about a, a year and uh, we have what we call the window of opportunity because people need to be able cognitively and physically to be able to carry this out. And the physical requirements are, they need to be able to turn the valve of the tank because our exit guides will not um, touch any of the equipment. So it's like twisting off a, a jar, the lid of a jar. They need to be able to pull the hood down. So they need to be able to uh, wash their hair, for example. And the third is they need to have the dexterity to attach the, the tube to the hood. And that's sort of like buttoning or unbuttoning a button. So I've had calls from people who are quadriplegic and they've said, well, let's stop right here because I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to, to do that. And then they've asked whether a friend or a spouse or a loved one could help them. And that's a very difficult um, uh, conversation because it puts that person at, at risk. So if the person was going to apply for uh, Final Exit Network support services, they would write a letter saying what their situation was. Um, and it doesn't, it can be a paragraph or two. I got one recently that was 16 pages. That was a bit of uh, overkill, but it just describes um, what what the diagnoses are, what treatments have been tried, what their quality of life is, what and why they're seeking the support of the organization. And that's supplemented with uh, medical records, a recent uh, physical and uh, specialists report saying that yes, this is in fact the case. And those get sent to the regional coordinator. Now I'm not the coordinator for California. So um, they would go to one of my colleagues and uh, that begins the application process. The next step is to arrange for another volunteer to interview the person uh, at some, some level of detail. Uh, is there a date in mind? Where would this take place? Um, are there pets involved? Who has access to this space? Uh, uh, family members, are they aware? Are they supportive? Um, lots of, uh, of information gathering so that uh, when, when I get that report, then I send those three documents, the interview report, the uh, medical records, and the uh, person's statement, which is signed and dated. And those go to our medical evaluation committee, which is a team of three physicians who um, will evaluate the paperwork. They will never have spoken to the client and they make a determination. And it goes one of three ways. Uh, usually if it gets that far, it, uh, yes, this application is accepted for exit guide assignment. So in some cases, they will say, uh, we really would like to have another test or another document from this specialist, some additional supplemental information from a medical uh, professional. And then the third is the least favorite part of, of my um, position, which is, I'm sorry, this application is not accepted. And that you had never has anything to do with the person's quality of life because we don't put ourselves in a position to judge that. But we, um, it's more about risk management for the organization, for the volunteers. Um, 
and it's very challenging to um, to make that call and tell the person after they've jumped through all those hoops uh, that that we're not going to be able to support them. Now they still have some other options which we can help them think through, but it's very um, it's very challenging. Um, and then let's assume that the per that the application is accepted. At that point, then the regional coordinator uh, identifies an exit guide who is available to work with that person and travel to that part of the country. So our exit, our, our volunteers uh, are all over the, the country and except for during the pandemic, were available uh, to hop on a plane and uh, be anywhere to support the clients. That has, uh, of course, been compromised during so, uh, applications were, um, we had a, a bit of a temporary uh, change in our protocol. So the way it works is the exit guide talks to the client, goes over some of the same issues just to get as clear a picture of what the situation is. If they're satisfied that there are no red flags and red flags can include, um, uh, oh, dysfunctional family members, like, oh, I don't want my husband to know, or my, uh, um, there are all kinds of red flags that the exit guide uh, might encounter. So he works with the person to fig help figure out now who needs to know what, who doesn't need to know anything, um, how to move forward. And when they're satisfied, they usually send the client a list of equipment and it's uh, seven items. And once the, um, once the client has ordered and has those pieces on site, uh, they call the exit guide. The exit guide makes what we call an education visit, shows them how to assemble the equipment. They don't touch anything. Um, and uh, I just remember with my uh, pal, Margaret, she was losing her eyesight, she was losing cognition, and she was so frustrated and she kept saying, can't somebody help me, can't somebody help me? And the answer was no, the guides were incredibly patient, they figured out workarounds, but they could not touch anything. So uh, once, so the, uh, the equipment has been assembled, they do sort of a, a, a test run, a dress rehearsal, and at that point, the client has everything they need to be able to affect this exit themselves. So they can, they can do it on their own, or what often takes happens is when the time comes, they call the exit guide back and say, okay, now I'm ready. When, when can you come and be with me at the exit? So that, uh, that's the, the whole protocol. Um, and uh, I guess I'll stop there for now and just see what, um, what's come up in the chat. Okay. Uh, Carl dropped a question about the organization um, and then Scott posted a link. I just want to verify that the link posted there is the correct one yes yes okay. thank you very much scott that's exactly right and there's a little bit of confusion um, because derek humphrey who is the founder of the hemlock society um still runs a, a website and that url is finalexit.org and he's the vendor for final exit 2020 so uh, we get calls saying, well, I tried to download the ebook Final Exit 2020 and it didn't work. Can you call me back? Well, it's, it's confusing. Um, so, uh, and speaking of confusing, um, let's see if I can pull up a document that I put together because um, 
there are so many organizations doing different things and they're all wonderful. Um, but so um, let's see how, in what order am I going to, well, I'll just start. Uh, so our organization, Final Exit Network, which we fondly refer to as FAN, was founded in 2004 and we're incorporated in Tallahassee. Um, but our executive director is in Chicago. And as I say, we have volunteers all over the country. There's, uh, and then um, Derek Humphrey's group is called Euthanasia Research and Guidance Organization, ergo, and it was founded in 1993. And that's the URL that's finalexit.org. So there's also a wonderful organization called Exit International, founded in 97 by Dr. Philip Nietzsche. And that, uh, and I can, I can post all of this. Um, there's also the Hemlock Society of San Diego, which was founded in 1987 by Faye Gersh. So all of these organizations, um, are similar and different. There's uh, a group called in Arizona called Choice and Dignity that was founded by John Abraham. There's a group called End of Life Washington. There's the national group Compassion and Choices based in Portland. And then there's the Death with Dignity National Center, um, again, headquartered in Oregon. So you can see it, there's a lot of, um, a lot of important work being done uh, and similarities in, in uh, and overlap in um, names and URLs. But we believe, we uh, Final Exit Network, believe that we're the only group that's actually doing um, on the ground, in-home uh, support for people seeking to uh, hasten their own death. So, um, so I see uh, Alyssa's um, comment and then I'll go back to some of the other ones. Um, how often is an exit guide present at the end? Uh, whenever the client wishes. Uh, we were doing some phone education visits when our, our exit guides weren't able to travel, but uh, in generally, if the client wants an exit guide there, they will be there. And um, how often a friend or family member or both? Um, yes, so my experience was that uh, there were two exit guides, the senior guide and the associate guide. Uh, and then my friend Margaret invited me to, um, to be there as her personal support system. So, uh, I doubt that the exit guides would want more than one or may possibly two uh, family members or friends, but that would be something to, to negotiate with the exit guides. Um, the question, who pays for the service and is it free? Uh, it's all free. We're all volunteers. Uh, we, we're a membership organization. We've had lots of bequests. The only cost to the client is the cost of the equipment, which um, runs about $300 uh, from what I'm given to understand. Um, and there's a question, does severe depression qualify as a condition for a final exit? Um, mental health issues are very, very challenging. And I don't want to say, uh, no, it doesn't, or yes, it does. Um, as I tell the clients I talk to, I never try to second guess our medical evaluation committee. What I tell people to do is write as strong a statement as they can uh, with as, as detailed medical records as are available. Um, it depends on whether they have the support of their, uh, their family members. Uh, partly it depends on age, how long has this been going on, treatments tried. So there's, there's not, at least to my mind, cut and dried answers to some of these questions. Um, but they're excellent, excellent questions. Um, what percent of the applications are accepted? Um, that 
that's a statistic that I don't really know because uh, in my experience, I talk, it, it's, uh, each step of the way is, um, is separate. So sometimes I talk to people and I send them the six option sheet and I send them how to initiate an application and they're so grateful and I never hear from them again. And sometimes they'll call me two weeks later and say, I'm ready to uh, submit my application or sometimes it's six months later. Um, so as soon as I've received the first uh, material, then I say, are you ready to set up an in interview? Usually it's yes, but sometimes it's uh, let's wait a while. So uh, the whole uh, pacing and uh, is set by the client and it, ne and it needs to be the client. It's not the client's spouse um, or lawyer or healthcare proxy it's the client. So they need to be able to uh, communicate. We've had some people who cannot speak and that's presented a challenge. Um, but I think uh, I could find out what the statistics are, but I think by the time it gets to the medical evaluation committee, the, the, the vast majority of um, applications are accepted. Uh, can I break in for just a second? Yeah, uh, we're too. actually in the Q and A section, so please raise your hand. Nobody has their hand up. Uh, I'll let our speaker continue going through the the chat questions. But uh, if you want to ask in person through the video, go ahead and raise your hand. Um, to, uh, are you ready to take? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. So, Dick, go ahead. Yes. Um, I just wanted to mention something that along with this that I discovered fairly accidentally about a year ago. Uh, I was always aware of the Neptune Society, although I'm not a member, but I found out about an organization called Trident Society, which I am now a member. And anybody that belongs to Neptune Society can tell me if it's basically the same thing. But for um, $3,000, I have a prepaid cremation. And I have a card that I carry on me with an 800 number. So wherever I die, they call this 800 number and they take care of picking me up and taking care of things. And the really neat thing that came with this is I have a great big box that has the um, urn for the ashes. And that box is where I have all of the information needed for people that are left behind when I die. All the documents. It, they provide you with this box and you put the information for your obituary, uh, who to notify and so forth. And I just found that this was a very comforting thing to have and I have a niece and nephew who are now in their early 60s who um, live paycheck to paycheck. And I know it's very expensive when death comes. Death is not cheap. <laughs> and so I got each of them a cremation so they don't have to worry about it. Anyway, I thought people might be interested in that. I could put the information in the chat. Jim, do you have any comments? Um, yeah, that's a great resource. The more um, attention to those details that um, can be done in advance, the better for those left behind. There are all kinds of uh, books and workbooks and online things. Um, to make sure that people's affairs are in order. And some people 
I, I remember going to a uh, will writing workshop at the public library some years ago, and it was so well done. And it was really under attended. And I asked the presenter, why isn't everyone taking advantage of this? And he said, magical thinking. People think that if they have their will in order that they're inviting the Grim Reaper. So, uh, and in fact, it's just the other way around. Um, so yeah, Dick, that's a really good piece of advice. Uh, and uh, sort of the other side, or in addition to having one's advanced care directive, one's healthcare proxy, all of the pieces of what you do or don't want uh, to make sure that your wishes are observed at end of life. Because um, of course, all of us want to die in bed asleep at home, but only a small percentage of us get that uh, wish granted. So we may not be able to communicate, we may, um, so uh, as detailed uh, advanced care directives. Um, and my brother is a palliative physician in the state of Washington. And he counseled me, don't worry about which, you know, oh, I don't want a ventilator, or I do want a feeding tube or this and that. Uh, he said, focus on the quality of life. I want to be able to do this. And if I can't do that. Um, and so uh, there are many, many, many versions of advanced care directives. And um, so I re recently redid mine. And the, what I did was take the one from Kaiser Permanente, because I figured that my physicians would be most familiar with that form. And some are just a page or two, and some go, some go on for pages and pages and pages, but find the right one and make sure you talk to your uh, physician uh, about it. Um, so I see, uh, uh, have there been legal ch challenges? And if so, were they overcome? Is final exit uh, available in all states? So uh, yes, final exit is available in all states. It doesn't have to be one of the states that has um, medical aid in dying. Um, and yes, there have been legal challenges. Uh, and in fact, we're in the middle of one right now. Um, but our, our legal counsel who's based in Tallahassee uh, has, um, brought uh, a lawsuit against the state of Minnesota in federal court to um, uh, about freedom of speech, saying that our exit guides should be able to provide information and support to people choosing to hasten their own death. So uh, one of the things that we urge is discretion because um, people who don't need to know about your plans don't need to know. And we've had several situations where um, police have been alerted by either a family member or a friend, probably well-meaning, but they have thrown a wrench into the works and in most cases made sure that the person's personal wishes to hasten their own death were not going to be possible, at least not using uh, the services of Final Exit Network. Um, we got an, a number of hands up. So right. Um, let's see. That's okay. So I'll go with uh, Paul. Paul Morell. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, my question slash comment is um, uh, that there's it, there's talk of dignity, death, dignity, and, and choice. Um, and what I find is that Final Exit Network and the other organizations that are kind of in this space use a tremendous amount of judgment in determining who is entitled uh, or eligible for uh, a, a dignified death, a, a death with, with choice. Um, and there's so much stigma and taboo around the issue of suicide. And it, I find it shocking and kind of honestly insulting that the organizations 
take this position where you know you've got to jump through hoops to provide the justification as to why you as a a fully competent adult can't just say you know i'm i'm done i'm 60 years old and i'm i'm done why i mean i understand that there's legal challenges with that and there's a lot of religion that comes behind those uh, legal challenges in the existing legislative environment but final exit network and the others won't even talk about the absurdity of that and why you know really the goal should be to allow competent adults to make decisions about their own lives and when they want to end it that's my comment slash question i'd love to hear your thoughts i i couldn't agree more um, and I, I think you sort of answered the question, the part of the question that's a question. I've heard Philip Nitschke, uh, who's the head of Exit International, talk about this very same thing, that we end up by default becoming the gatekeepers. Oh, you can't do this, or you have to do this, or you have to jump through this hoop. And it's absolutely not the way it should be, but for uh, because of legal situation, in pretty much all over the world, um, that's that's the state of affairs now. But I agree, every every person should be able to um, affect their own decisions. And many of the people I talked to uh, Im immediately um, Im imply or, or refer to the abortion issue. Um, so who has the right to tell somebody what they can or can't do with their body, whether it's at the beginning of life or at the end of life. So I completely agree. Thank you for your comment. Uh, okay, got another hand up. Um, Chip, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Unmute your, there you go. Um, I'm not a gun nut but I always assume that the Second Amendment subsumes the right to die. That's all. Well, uh, yeah. Um, well, and I'll tell, I'll tell a little story. So I, I um, have taken the exit guide training and I'll, uh, talk to uh, talk about the training and the background, um, but I did one education visit with uh, a person who uh, was in excruciating, agonizing pain, and he had the equipment. We showed him how to assemble it, and we were waiting for that second call to say, "Okay, I'm I'm ready." And we didn't hear, and we didn't hear, and we didn't hear, and we subsequently learned that he shot himself. That he did. He had a peaceful, painless way to exit, and he chose another option. So I think everybody has a different criteria. When I mentioned voluntary stopping of eating and drinking to some of my uh, potential clients. They cut me off immediately saying, I'd rather take a gun out to the back 40. Um, so everybody, each person I talk to has a different situation, a different set of criteria, a different time frame. Each, each uh, is unique and inarguable. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow on with that question. It, it also seems like even though guns are pretty effective, they're still not 100% effective and it could be, could leave you in a worse situation, I, I guess. Yes, and people have tried, I've had clients try with guns, with razor blades, with pills, all different manner, and then they sheepishly call me and say, and I'm still here. Um, and so, that's one of the uh, reasons I re recommend the Peaceful Pill Handbook, because it goes through all of the risks of various modalities so that people can make an informed decision on what they what might work for them. Okay. Uh, Dana and Jerry, 
I don't know which of you have, is asking the both, question. Both, both, <clears throat> both of us, Dana first. <clears throat> oh yeah, I was kind of wondering um, uh, if the person um, ends up in a hospital uh, because there's been like um, some kind of uh, cardiovascular incident or um, some kind of advanced pain management problem, whether on morphine or whatever. And um, if they have a, a directive already um, that they've already set up, whether your organization can go into the hospital setting or how that, do they have to come home first? They probably have to come home first. We probably would not be able to support them in a hospital setting. And um, one of the questions that we often pose is, are you eligible for hospice? And it, it always depends on the facility, uh, whether it's hospice or ho hospital, um, even uh, the living communities, it depends on what kind of security there is. Um, uh, it's each, each um, situation, as I say, is um, unique. And as was alluded to previously, many of these facilities are run by religious organizations. And so you can't even choose the hospital or hospice that might support uh, hastening one's own death, because it's not a question you can say, oh, well, I'm thinking of uh, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Will you support me? They, they, they probably would not even answer the question. Um, so it's, it's really an unfortunate challenge and complicates the whole arena. Thank you. So uh, yeah, two, two parts. Uh, in, in response to Dick Hewitson's comment about cost of uh, cremation and all, um, <clears throat> It can be expensive, and and my parents did not want to spend a lot of money on it, so <clears throat> they did a, the research before my father died, and the end result was that the my brothers made a pine box. Um, they found a uh, cremation place that did not require a funeral parlor to uh, to deal with, so that they could take it. So my parents, my mother, and my brothers could take him, my dad, directly to the. Um, cremation and the end result it was only cost them a few hundred dollars but that it, it's not an easy thing to do and it does require some advanced planning um, <clears throat> the other issue is um, my father had uh, a stroke that left him completely paralyzed on one side with aphasia which made it a bit hard to understand what he was saying um, and we think that he may have uh, wanted to die early. So is uh, the prob one of the problems with strokes is that you can live for many years and never recover. So, you know, my, my question is, is a, is a stroke sufficient for this end of life process? Well, it depends. Yeah, the lot, again, a lot of uh, complicating factors. What mm -hmm. what does the advanced care directive look like? What is the uh, uh, opinion of the medical proxy? What are the prognoses? Uh, what are the physical and or cognitive abilities? Uh, similarly with Alzheimer's, the person may have said, you know, I want this, um, but they're, if they're uh, past the point of cognition to be able to, to affect their own exit, it's likely not to, not to take place. Well, my, my dad was, uh, because of the aphasia, it was kind of hard to tell the cognitive, but there was one particular incident that it looked like it, the brain was still working pretty well behind the, the interference. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, he was completely paralyzed on one side, but he could still use, make some use of the other side. So he might've been able to do it by himself. But this has got to be a common problem because I remember one time I was walking through a, a Kaiser hospital and for some reason I was walking through the, the stroke ward and there are a lot of people in that in the stroke ward. Mm -hmm. 
So have you uh, actually dealt with some people who've um, had strokes? And um, I'm sure the organization has. I personally, I've only, I've been doing this since uh, September, 2018. And I don't think I've had um, people suffering from strokes. Um, but one of the things is uh, to have a conversation, repeated conversations, documentation, um, as many as many pieces in place, so that let's say in your father's case, all the family members knew that he had always said, "If this happens to me, please help me exit," um, because I think. Uh, as we keep alluding to, the the medical establishment is uh, terrified of legal ramifications. So uh, discretion, um, it, it's not the way it should be, but, and there's no straightforward answer to each uh, specific situation. Yeah, okay. I'm a little bit surprised that you haven't mentioned that nobody's mentioned Dr. Kavarkian yet because he certainly brought a lot of light to this problem. He certainly did. Yeah, he's one of the pioneers uh, of the right to die movement, which I didn't realize until recently. The the whole movement that we call right to die really started coming into being in the 70s with the advent of the ventilator. Once people could be kept alive on a ventilator, that's because otherwise people were dying the way people die. And so it was the keeping them alive that had to be, uh, keeping them alive artificially that then yeah. had to be, counter, be counterbalanced. So uh, yeah, the whole history of the right to die movement is, is, um, is very interesting. And um, yeah, there's lots of uh, books and films. Um, on a, if you go to finalexitnetwork.org, we have something called Conversation Starters, uh, books and articles and films that we recommend that if there are people who don't want to discuss this, that this might be a way to at least broach the, um, the stigmatized topic. Um, let me answer a couple of the questions uh, that have come in on the chat. Uh, so what training or background do guides have? So um, they go through a multiple day training and I did the most recent one in uh, Chicago in I guess 2019, even knowing I had said that I don't wanna work as an exit guide that I'm happy working as a coordinator. And um, so they're shown exactly how the system works, they try it, and then um, they have applied to become uh, what we call an associate guide, and they work with a senior guide, someone who has done uh, many visits, has worked with people, and so it's always a team. And once the associate guide has a certain number of on-site visits and feels confident so uh, then they have graduated can, to become a senior guide. Um, so it's a fairly rigorous uh, experiential uh, training program. And uh, can the organization support you if you're in a hospice setting? Um, uh, yes. And in fact, we prefer if um, the person is, well, there, and there's two kinds of hospice. There's residential hospice um, and there's um, institutional. So you're either at your at home and the hospice worker comes to visit you or you're in a, uh, a hospice facility. Now, uh, in the home setting, yes, Final Exit Network could definitely support you. In the hospice uh, institutional setting, that again would be a negotiation uh, between the exit guide, the client, perhaps um, directly inquiring of with the hospice, uh, some might allow it and some might not. Um, what? Oh, this is an excellent question. Uh, what 
how much, uh, what's the timeline from application to being available? So we say with all the paperwork going back and forth and we only use telephone and snail mail. So no email, no texting, which of course uh, is much more convenient, but to, for, to protect people's privacy. Um, so we estimate that it, uh, it takes about six to eight weeks from the time I send the client how to initiate an application, they send the materials back to me, I call them, I arrange for the interview, I bundle everything and get them to, a, to an exit guide. About two months. So, and sometimes that's way too long. Somebody doesn't have two months. And so our support services are not going to be viable for that, that person. Okay. I think there's all the questions from the chat. So we have uh, Fran and Jim. Should be able to unmute yourselves. There you go. Okay. Uh, I had a friend who was uh, on hospice care with Kaiser and she was placed in a palliative coma. And how does that fit into what you're talking about? Um, again, each individual's uh, characteristic is, is different. Um, one thing I've learned about Kaiser is that they, if one applies for and qualifies for the medical aid in dying, that Kaiser will pay for the drugs, for the cocktail. And I recently got a new GP, so I uh, said I wanted to talk to him about it. And boy, he was a, a young physician and he was so uncomfortable talking to me about um, my work in the Right to Die movement, the, the possibility of um, hastening one's death. He, it, was, it was almost comical how poorly trained he'd been and um, how uncomfortable he was talking about the issue. So I really think it depends. Each case is what, again, what the paperwork has been, what the client has put together before such a situation arrives, what the personal um, willingness of the physician. My brother, as I said, is a palliative care physician and he has said that many of his colleagues for their personal and or religious beliefs will not support a, per, a client's request for um, hastening their death, which I think is completely unprofessional and um, irresponsible, but it happens. So um, as was, uh, um, I think it was Paul who said, you know, the whole landscape needs to change the medical community, the legal community, this, uh, this, need, this whole topic needs to come out of the shadows and uh, people need to advocate for their own civil right. Okay. Uh, back to Dick Hewitson. Hi, uh, I have a couple of anecdotes and then uh, something else I want to mention that might lead to another interesting program. <laughs> uh, my anecdotes, uh, the first one is I met Dr. Kevorkian, uh, where I've met a lot of absolutely marvelous people throughout my lifetime at Freedom From Religion Foundation. He was, one of, he was a speaker way back when. Um, the other thing is knowing about, I just learned from Jim, I did not realize that uh, the problems with helium, that's always been in the back of my mind. And when I was in rehab in Mountain View three years ago, in a place that I think was a branch of hell, I noticed that they had helium for their balloons. And I, it went through my mind that maybe I could steal the helium in case I needed it. Um, the thing I wanted to bring up 
for the organization is I think Jim, you and I were both at a, a workshop on writing your own obituary, which I thought was a really marvelous thing. And because of that, I have, and I think Jim has probably written his own obituary too. Uh, do you remember who did that, Jim? That might be an interesting speaker. Um, I don't, but I'll look it up because I agree that was a wonderful uh, workshop. And uh, I just remember her talking about the different kinds of obituaries and how it didn't need to be a resume of yeah. the school you went to and every job you had and every book you'd written. Um, it, it was really, uh, and I'm fascinated by obituaries because it's a celebration of a life. Yes. And the more details and the more anecdotes. So I think the exercise to write one's own obituary uh, is to highlight what, what that person, yeah. what I think is important in my life, rather than somebody after the fact saying, oh, well, he did this and he, he didn't do that. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm a control freak, but I want, I want to have a say into what, uh, what well, gets said about me. What you're saying is exactly what I remember from it, too. And I remember her saying, this is not a resume. You're not applying for a job. <laughs> right. It should be a celebration of your life and what was important to you as a person. Right. So it was a delightful Yeah. I'll find her name and yeah, she was wonderful. Other okay. questions or comments? Looks like you've answered all our questions. <laughs> I doubt that, but. <laughs> I, I, I'm a, a co-host, so I can't raise my hand, but I was, um, I forgot what I was going to ask. Um, I was wondering, in states that, that uh, allow physician-assisted suicide, are you still called in? It must make the job a lot easier if they, they have the doctor providing medication. Yes, no, it's sort of, it's two, that's a really good question. Uh, it's two parallel universes. So either one would apply for medical aid in dying or and it's usually the cases where they're not, they don't qualify, but then they contact um, Final Exit Network. I, I, there may be, may be cases where the two work together, but it seems unlikely. Yeah, I would imagine that, that family members are, might be one of the biggest problems. Yes, I, I think that's, that's the case that, uh, you know, we knew mom wanted this and we knew she didn't want that. And then somebody comes out of the woodwork and says, well, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I had an experience with my father who had had a stroke mm -hmm. and um, we knew he did not want extreme measures. And he was in a, I think he was in a hospice setting and was prepared to I think he was preparing to voluntarily stop eating and drinking and it couldn't be accomplished in that facility because they were afraid some night nurse might um, object. Like, so he was brought home, brought to my bro brother's home, fortunately got pneumonia and died a few weeks later but couldn't do what we all knew that he wanted to do in that care facility. Yeah, when my mother had her stroke, uh, she was in a, a facility for quite a while. And um, at one time she just lost her appetite and stopped eating. And one of the doctors wanted to, to force feed her to put a, a feeding tube in. And, I thought it was surprising. The, the nuns at the facility told my sister not to let the doctor do this to your mother. Great advice, yeah. Because yeah. and once a ventilator or a feeding tube is put in, it can, it's very complicated to get that support system removed. 
and and even after the stroke, you know, we we joke among ourselves that she could still outlive us all. She's got a strong heart. Mm -hmm. Dark humor there. I see some more hands, and I'm not sure if they're new or left over from previous. Uh... Uh, they're they're new ones. Uh, I was just waiting for Alex to get done. So, uh, Lisa. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I had dental surgery, but I'm going to speak as clearly as I can. Um, I'm just I'm a social worker in a palliative care specialty practice, and um, we often often, not often, but when, when patients ask for information about End of Life Option Act or other options, we will share that information. And I have to say that I was not familiar with this organization. And I'm wondering if you do educational outreach to physician groups or palliative care groups. And um, I... I guess that's my main question. Just, uh, I, you know, because we want to be thorough. At least well, the social worker group for sure wants to be thorough. But th just, just to say that the, the doctors are required to give all options from hospice to end of life, op life option for people who ask. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. I'm so glad you raised it. Um, and that's one thing that the organization is trying to do is to raise our our profile because we've been referred to as sort of a in the shadows renegade little group and it shouldn't be that way. Um, so the document uh, that we put together six options, which includes our organization should be made available to all physicians, all nurses, all hospice workers, everybody. Um, but as you point out, usually the protocol is that the, the patient has to request it. it the, even the palliative care physician can't take it upon themselves to say, oh, and you might be interested in looking at this. So uh, it's, it's, again, complicated, uh, patient specific, but yeah, I'd love to talk to you more about ways that you might think that we can, we, the Final Exit Network, can get, help get the word out, because I think this is an important arena to changing the, increasing and changing the conversation. Yeah, I'd like to propose that we bring you in to speak to the group. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim, do you have contact information? Um, yeah, let me, I'll just put my... Uh, Let's see, how do I do this? And drop whatever you need in the, whatever you have in the chat. Uh, let's see. Uh, it looks like it's going to individual. Let me see how I can. Oh, to do to a specific, to, to everybody, you have to change the two drop down, scroll all the way to the top to everyone. Okay, let's see. Okay. <laughs> Two. Hmm. Not, not working. Well, I'm somehow clicking on. So I can I can send one to Dick, but I can't. Um, let's see if I can. If I go out of it completely. No, now I'm in iPhone. Oh. Hmm. Are you on an iPhone or something? No, I'm not, but I don't know how to scroll okay. up. Yeah, the drop down window, you should be able to scroll up and all the way to the top. Sorry to take that, If that doesn't work, you could always send it to Dick and have Dick forward it to everyone. Is that, yeah, <laughs> why don't I do that rather than waste your time while I, my technical skills are <laughs> yeah. embarrassingly. Um, yeah, because I'll send Dick the uh, name of that obituary uh, workshop leader 
as well as my contact information. And I'm more than happy to, um, to talk to any of you or, or provide more information um, because I think this is such an important topic. And I'm a relative newcomer to the Right to Die movement, uh, as I say, but some of my colleagues have been in it for decades and are so inspiring and so committed. And um, it's, it's just uh, such an important arena. So it looks like there are a few more questions. And we got a bunch of hands up. So we'll go back to Fran and Jim. Okay. I unfortunately missed the um, uh, an earlier part of your talk. And I would like some information on uh, do it yourself. Although I don't intend to employ it immediately, I had considered for some time the advantages of using a uh, nitrogen method for exit. But I was wondering, um, first, how easy is it to obtain a small tank of nitrogen? Second, can you use uh, these um, nasal cannula or something that goes into both nostrils rather than a hood, which would be much simpler to obtain? And how long would it take um, after you lose consciousness uh, which I understand can be can occur in a considerable euphoric state. Um, how long does it take for your heart to cease beating? Would you happen to know any of these details? Yeah. Uh, again, I'll refer you to um, the Peaceful Pill Handbook, which uh, goes through all the modalities and uh, the time frames, the availability, uh, and um, it's an excellent resource as is Final Exit 2020. So um, those are two really valuable resources that might help you as you explore options. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chip. So um, I have an anecdote, but there's only one little corner of it that poses the question. Um, <clears throat> my father passed, and then a few years later, uh, we got the famed letter from his second wife saying, by the time you get this, I'll be gone. Uh, the timing and the finances, however, poses a question that could be discussed. Uh, in January of that year, she filed her taxes. Um, she was a 40-hour-a-week worker at a uh, alcohol, uh, a CHP alcohol diversion center. So she did intake and patient work. and so she, But she had an income, and she donated some of it to AA. And this year, in January, she filed her taxes including a $100,000 donation to AA that was entirely mythical. This resulted in a $30,000 uh, tax refund, which she got and took to Oregon, where she found a facility that would accommodate her needs. And we were left with an apartment full of books and this letter. However, that leads to the question of the finances. She uh, tricked our system into giving her her entire taxable in tax due on the previous year uh, to finance this. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely no expertise in that arena. Sorry. Okay. I guess we'll go on to Dan and Jerry again. Yeah. 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 I had a question about um, I've been supporting an organization called Compassion and Choices, which was formerly a Hemlock Society, I guess. And they changed their name about, I don't know, 10 years ago. And, um, but I'm kind of wondering um, uh, uh, how, I mean, there must be several organizations that do this kind of work and how you can get a comprehensive uh, 
picture of that and, and, and choose which organization you might want to go with. And I wonder if you had any suggestions. Yeah, at the beginning of my talk, I went through uh, the list of all the organizations, or not even all of them, but many of them. And you're right, there are lots of them and there's overlap and Compassion and Choices developed out of the Hemlock Society as, and Final Exit Network developed out of one wing of the Hemlock Society as well. So uh, I have a whole family tree of how these organizations fit together and separated and the Sometimes there were personalities involved. I know that's going to be shocking. Um, so it, it's very complicated. But if you uh, if you want to contact me, I did finally figure out how to put my email in the chat. Um, I can send you some resources uh, to help with that. They all all of them do really important work, and uh, many of them work together. Many of them don't. For example, compassion and choices does not. Um, even though we're we're from the same uh, Genesis does not approve of the work that Final Exit Network does. Well, my impression was that they did a lot of legislative work. Exactly. And, Advocacy yeah. and legislation, which is so important. Um, but I think it takes, it takes all different uh, avenues of activism to change this situation. So it looks like we might have time for one more question. Michael, do you um, Michael, go ahead. Yes, uh, so uh, two related questions. Uh, can you say how many people are you helping, say, every, every year on average? And uh, also, I saw at uh, your website that you have only about 30 this exit guides. It uh, seems a very, a very low number. So probably you have uh, a big sort of waiting list because this is for the whole country, right? Right, and I don't have the statistics available right now, but if you email me, I'll, I'll look them up. Um, but I think part of this is uh, uh, the numbers are probably low because one, not, every, not many people know about us. I, I wasn't familiar with the organization until my friend called me. Um, and then uh, the stigma of family members. Um, so uh, what I find is that um, many people brought great solace by knowing about us and don't actually you end up using our services. So the statistics might be a little bit uh, misleading, but the numbers are, are relatively low and I do know that um, from the um, from the states that have the the cocktail, the physician assisted, uh, many times the patient will get the get the approval, get the physician to uh, uh, write the prescription. The pharmacist will fill it, and they will have it, and never use it. They just need to know that they have that option. Good, uh, they want it. So I think that might be, to some extent, true with our services as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I know you need to leave at 12.30, so I'm gonna uh, thank you all so much for your, the questions have been great, and I really appreciate everybody's interest. Um, please feel free to contact me. I'm happy to, uh, to share my limited expertise and point you in a direction if you have uh, additional or more detailed questions. So thank you all. Thank you, Dick, for uh, roping me into this. And uh, I guess I'll sign off and you can all go into your, your general discussion. And so thank you so much. Mm -hmm.